Okay, we're starting. So I want to welcome everybody to the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems uh, Spring 2021 seminar series. And um, this is going to be obviously our last seminar before spring break, which is coming up this coming week. So it's my pleasure to introduce, I think for the first time, uh, certainly uh, in our seminar series, um, Dr. Claire Welty, I think for most faculty and fellow researchers, um, Claire doesn't necessarily need an introduction, but I think for many people who don't know her, uh, it's worth hearing this story. So let me tell you a little bit about Claire. She's director of the Center for Urban Environmental Research and Education and professor of chemical, biochemical, and environmental engineering at UMBC. Her research focuses on quantifying the urban water cycle and biogeochemical fluxes at multiple scales using a combination of mathematical modeling and field observations. At UMBC, she also hosts the field headquarters of the Baltimore Ecosystem Study Long-Term Ecological Research Project. She has served as chair of the Water Science and Technology Board of the National Research Council and chair of the board of directors of the Consortium for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science, Inc. Dr. Welty is the lead PI on the new urban critical zone cluster in the National Science Foundation's new critical zone collaborative network. And um, I'm sure for many of our faculty, Claire uh, is someone that they already know. Some of our students have not seen her before. We've been working together on projects for, I guess it's like 18 years now. Um, and so you're gonna hear uh, a, a lot of interesting stories about some of the work that she's been involved in. So I'm just going to stop talking and uh, invite Claire to take it away. Okay, so I work on a number of things, but today I'm going to focus on the modeling aspect of the work. And it would not be possible without, of, of course, all of the great um, the great students and collaborators. So Andy, this is not. Oh, there it goes. I just needed to. I just need to click on something else. Okay. So just to diffuse um, issues about models, in case Stu Schwartz is in the, in the audience, um, a very famous quote is, all models are approximations. Essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. However, the approximate nature of the model must always be borne in mind. And so that quote comes, uh, it's attributed mostly to George Box, who's a statistician from 1976. So I just thought I would put that out there to start off with this, okay? So that's the caveat of all this work. Okay. so. What I want to talk about is um, I'm going to talk about, first of all, why we would use a numerical model in hydrologic research. All right. So there are a number of uses. This is just some examples. So you can use the models to do hypothesis testing. For example, we call these numerical sandboxes. You could build the sandbox and then change things in the sandbox, see what happens. Um, you can use the models to provide insight to mechanistic understanding of complex processes. You can run sensitivity analysis on parameters of the models. You can do scenario building for the future. So everybody's familiar with climate change modeling and predicting into the future. So you can do that with any, any models. If you, you have a, 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 a future data stream of inputs, you can make predictions for the future. So those are some examples of what you can do with models sort of as um, in, in hydrologic research. So that's where we're coming from in our use. We're not just trying to model a site for the sake of modeling, it's gotta be some purpose. Okay, so I'm a groundwater hydrologist and I'm an engineer. Um, and the modeling I do is of urban systems because that's what's interesting. Someone has an open mic, Andy. Andy. I'm not sure who has the open mic, but please mute yourself if you have an open mic. So much is typing and I it's just clicking yeah. away. Okay. So um there are many kinds of hydrologic models out there and for the purposes of modeling urban systems, which is my interest, I use um, a model called Parflow CLM and CLM used to stand for common land model. It now stands for community land model. It's a land surface model. So Parflow itself it was originally a, a groundwater model developed by the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And then it's evolved into this coupled surface subsurface hydrologic model as cared for by Reed Maxwell, who was for a long time at the Colorado School of Mines. He just moved to Princeton University this academic year. So Parflow CLM is the model we use because we're interested in subsurface processes. And the way this works, let's see if I can get this pen to work, is as follows. So we specify meteorologic forcing, all right? We use NLDOS data, North American Land Data Assimilation System, 
to give us precipitation, temperature, solar radiation, wind speed, and then um, it utilizes the land cover we specify, okay, to calculate evapotranspiration, all right? So it has relationships between land cover and um, effects on evapotranspiration. So that's what I mean there. So we have these independent inputs that go into the into the into this land surface model. And this provides the upper boundary conditions to our domain, precipitation and evapotranspiration. Then independently, we have to come up with the following topography of the domain, the soil and rock permeability, porosity, location in our case, we're here in the Piedmont, the bedrock saprolite interface. And then in urban areas, there are all kinds of leaks in and leaks out. So if we care to include that, we have to estimate the recharge from leaking drinking water pipes. All right. And so all that goes into um, PAR flow. So PAR flow is a physically based model. It's a coupling of the um, conservation equations, uh, conservation of mass and momentum equations. Uh, and so those are the inputs. And then the outputs are pressure head and saturation of every cell and domain, whether it's you know a stream cell or a groundwater cell. And so from this raw output, you can derive aquifer levels or stream flow in terms of discharge of streams, okay? So this output also affects the soil moisture state in the unsaturated zone. So we're modeling everything from the streams down through the unsaturated zone to the saturated zone. And so then of course the soil moisture state, the state feeds back into CLM because you have moisture there available for you know, evaporation um, from your solar radiation beating down on, on, on the model. So that's the, the system we use. There are many other similar systems. That's just the one we've chosen to use for a number of reasons. So that's what I'm talking about here. Okay, so I'm gonna go step through three um, applications. And if I don't have, if I run out of time after the first two, I'll just skip the third one. So the first application of this modeling system. So I'm not writing the model, okay? That's what Lawrence Livermore National Lab and Remax will have done. They write the model. We are users of the model applied to urban areas. And applying this to urban areas is squirrely because there's a lot of data that is what we call dark data. It's hard to get, it's hard to find. It's in file cabinets and, and drawers and, and hard copies and not in PDF files. It's not necessarily just in some nice downloadable database. Okay, so the challenge is the data assimilation and then interpretation, but we're not the, the people writing the model and there are others that do that. So the, the community land model is kept by NCAR and, um, and then Reed is the keeper of PAR flow. Okay, so here is an application and this ap first application is a regional scale application. So this is to the Baltimore metropolitan region. And this work was carried out by Aditi Baskar um, as part of, not all of, part of her PhD dissertation at UMBC in environmental engineering. Um, in, and she graduated in 2000 and I think for, for, uh, 15, 14, something like that. The, the paper came out later. Um, but at any rate, um, this was part of a um, NSF project for coupled uh, funded by the Coupled Human Natural Systems Program. And what she was ultimately doing, I'm not gonna talk about today, she was coupling the output of the hydrologic model with an urban growth model to see how into the future with predicted changes in growth patterns, how the hydrologic um, system would change. Okay, so that was her ultimate goal. I'm not talking about the day, I'm just gonna talk about the hydrologic part which is, you know, you'll see in and of itself is, um, you know, there's a lot to talk about. All right, so she modeled the whole Baltimore metropolitan region, which is a very large scale. Um, I mean, there are people who model the whole Chesapeake Bay watershed, there are people who model the whole continental United States. So this is not, you know, as large as the applications have been. You can apply this model to any scale. So what I wanna show you, the power of the model and why we like it. Um, so on the left is showing impervious surface cover and the scale and the titles of the counties in the region. And on the right, what I'm showing is just what it looks like when you spin up the model. So you drape the water table under the land surface and you spin it up and eventually the water rises to fill the valleys, to fill the streams, and then it drops in the hills and you can see that you get the streams form. So, you know, we input the topography and you input the geology and you input the locations of the um, an initial water level below land surface. Then when you when you spin up, um, you see the, the um, you see the um, you see the streams form. Okay, that's so that's just so the point the point of all this is, and you know, I've, I'm emitting a lot of, of details just to give you a, a, a snapshot of an idea. The point is, we have full connection of the surface and subsurface. All right, through the unsaturated zone. 
and it just gives you an idea. Now, her model was very coarse, 500 meter pixels in the XY direction and in the Z direction, five meter pixels, but it was, you know, cursive dimensionality for this very large region. So it's, you know, relatively coarse model. Okay, so what Aditi was interested in, and now Aditi Baskar, Dr. Baskar is an assistant professor at um, Colorado State University. She's been there after she did her postdoc. She's been there since like 2016 or 17. And um, that's, that's where she ended up and has her own, own program going there. So what she was interested in is what is what are the impacts of all these different urban features on subsurface storage at a regional scale? So we've got, in addition to natural systems where we have trees and shrubs, you know, pulling water out of the subsurface through evapotranspiration, we have all these anthropogenic perturbations going on. So um, we, when we have areas um, paved over, clearly the evapotranspiration is reduced because there are no trees. Um, urban hardscapes promote flashy runoff in addition to reduce evapotranspiration. We, there, there's a phenomenon that some of you may have ne not heard of before, which is called I and I, infiltration and inflow. When you have sewer pipes carry, that are carrying sewage to the wastewater treatment plant, if they're cracked, groundwater can leak into them and then bypass stream gauges. Okay, so you can have leaks in, you can have leaks out. So there's a net, you can, you know, some, the, the city of Baltimore has done actually put flow meters in their sewage pipes to, to calculate um, the net infiltration of groundwater into their wastewater pipes because they were trying to fix the leaks and they, you know, were trying to figure out where to line them, where to replace them, et cetera. So we actually have those numbers for Baltimore City. So there's, um, she was interested in how this affects water balance. And then there are all these other anthropogenic recharges and discharges. So in the ex-urban areas, you have private wells pulling water out of the subsurface. You have in areas like Anne Arundel County, you have community wells, um, you know, municipal wells. Um, there are surface water reservoir withdrawals for water supply. And then water supply leakage. Um, the last time we checked, leakage from pressurized water supply pipes is about 26% in Baltimore City. Now it may be reduced by now. Um, and then in the summertime, not terribly much around here, but to some degree, we have lawn irrigation. So you're taking potable water that you get, you know, you're paying for for your household and you're pouring it onto your lawn and garden, and then it seeps to the subsurface, it's adding to subsurface storage. So Aditi was interested in how these, you know, anthropogenic um, um, feature, how the urban features and the anthropogenic uh, fluxes uh, just balanced out, you know, whether you get a net increase or decrease. And the reason we're looking at subsurface storage is because, as opposed to just looking at water table level, which we get asked this question all the time, Subsurface storage is the volume, you know, of water that occupies the spaces in the subsurface, in the pores and the cracks. Um, and so people usually think, you know, the water table is the, top, you know, is the top of the of the saturated zone. But there's a lot of storage that goes on in the unsaturated zone as well. And so if we want to capture all of the storage, including the saturated zone, the unsaturated zone, that's why we talk about subsurface storage. So typically, we take the whole volume of the subsurface and we divide by the area of the watershed to get a, you know, we we talk about subsurface storage in terms of a depth. Okay, so that's just a conversion and it's because we want to include the unsaturated zone. Okay, so that's what she was interested in. So she marches through and and um, does, let's see, so let me shut off my cell phone. So I'm just trying to find it, right. Um, she marches through where the hydrogeology, so Baltimore, the Baltimore region spans the Piedmont into the coastal plain. So she, you know, went through various data sources and assimilated what is shown here are the um, the layered aquifers, aquitards in the coastal plain. And then she had the, um, in the Piedmont, you know, the soil saprolite and fractured rock. So she was trying to figure out um, what the hydraulic conductivity, you know, how to assign hydraulic conductivities, which is fundamental um, soil properties, uh, uh, you know, hydraulic properties to the, to these uh, materials. And all the anthropogenic perturbations she came up with either direct or indirect measures of. So water supply leakage, lawn irrigation, the soil hydraulic conductivity was a very uppermost layer. She used Sergo data. Um, soil and saprolite thickness, we use we use well casing thickness as a surrogate there. Impervious surfaces are there are plenty of maps of that, either at the national level or at the local level. And bedrock hydraulic conductivity. In recent years, there's been an effort to, to publish um, uh, uh, on a kind of a U.S. level hydraulic conductivity of bedrock, which is, is really helpful because it wasn't existing 15 years ago. So she did, she gathered all those data sets together and then distributed them in pixelated fashion into her model. Oh, the footprint of municipal areas. 
um, these are the areas where we have water served by municipal systems, either surface water or ground municipal groundwater wells. They're all those colored areas, the red dots are municipal wells. But outside of that in the white areas are private wells. And so every private well is a straw into the subsurface. And so we got at that data by looking at Maryland property view and, and assigning um, where we could see it was a private water supply, you know, we found the centroid of the property and assigned that a well and then just picked the literature, you know, pumping rate. And of course, water that's pumped out of private wells is a lot, most of it's put back in through the septic system. So that's another churning of water that she was trying to account for because it's a regional scale model. So um, she rolled all that into the model uh, and then she spun up for six years. And then this base case of the, the year she was looking at for her analysis was the, um, 2007. So she spun up for, to, through 2006 and then to get the, you know, to get, the, get the aquifer level, to get the water levels flowing in the street, get the streams flowing. And then this is a base case. So this is a typical, this is a typical cycle of hydrology uh, throughout the year. So this includes all those anthropogenic perturbations, leaks in, leaks out. And so the, the lessons here are, here you can see our precipitation rate throughout the year. And around here, you know, it rains year round. We might have some odd dry and wet spells, but for the most part, we have year round rain. So you can see it's raining all year long, as opposed to some parts of the world where there's a rainy season. We have rain pretty much year round. And then what the, the y axis on the left is showing is this I told you we were going to talk about subsurface storage. So take that total volume divided by the total area, it's like this bulk subsurface storage. And so what you can see should make a lot of sense that every time it rains, you get a little blip, an increase in subsurface storage, and then you get a dry down period. And you can see for the, even for the dry down periods, when you have little range, you get little blips, right? And then like for a big rain here, we got a big blip. So this would be normal. And then of course, what happens as you go throughout the hot summer months, you know, at leaf out is around April 10th around here. So you will get, and those of you who studied hydrology know this, you typically have you know, your highest aquifer levels or subsurface storage in late spring, and you have your lowest levels, you know, in, in October-ish, right? And that's what we see here. So this, this engendered, you know, confidence that the model was producing some version of reality that made sense, right? It's raining on the, on the area, and we're seeing the subsurface storage change in response to events and in response to seasonal changes we'd expect over the course of a year. Okay, so that, that was, and that includes all the ins and outs. So then what she did was she analyzed uh, four scenarios. She analyzed a scenario called the vegetated city. So in this case, she converted all the, the urban land cover, any pixels that were greater than 70% impervious area, she converted to natural vegetation, okay? So you would think, if you go from impervious to vegetation, you're going to increase evapotranspiration because you have the vegetation pulling water out of the subsurface. For the pervious city, these and these are all separate scenarios. So the base case, then she would take one thing out, put it back, and then take something else out, et cetera, or convert something else. The pervious city scenario, all the impervious surface, ugh, impervious surface cover was removed. And instead of a very low, 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 low hydraulic conductivity, impervious surface cover, background soil hydraulic conductivity was used. Then her no I and I scenario was infiltration and inflow of groundwater and stormwater into, into wastewater pipes was removed. And then her no anthropogenic discharge and recharge charge scenarios, all anthropogenic discharges and recharges were removed. So the infiltration of the pipes, the reservoir withdrawals, the well withdrawals, the water supply pipe leakage, the lawn irrigation, all of it was removed from the model. And the idea was to see, well, you know, what, what resulted, you know, how important were all these all these perturbations to the whole system. Okay, so just remember, this is a modeling result. Okay, so this is what we predict. All right, it's not measured. Okay, so here's our summary. Um, here is our summary slide, and I should say this was published in Water Resources Research in 2015. And um, Reed Maxwell, who's a keeper of Parflow, is one of the co-authors, as is our Andy and myself. Um, that's the et al. There. <laughs> okay. So what she did was she subtracted her base case from the other cases, right? And then divided by precipitation minus evapotranspiration. So pre precipitation minus evapotranspiration would be kind of a, the natural, um, you know, change, uh, give rise to natural change in storage. So what you see here for her base case is a black line is zero because she, 
she subtracted it from itself, right? That's the base case. So that way she was able to isolate each one of these, um, each one of these uh, scenarios. And so this is a percent difference, all right? Percent difference between the base case and the studied case. So the case that had most impact was the no I and I. So when she removed, when she, um, Remove the infiltration of inflow of groundwater into the wastewater pipes, meaning that it was no longer being removed from the subsurface. That had the greatest cumulative increase throughout the year. Okay, so, but we're talking about ultimately it's around 11%. This is all blown up. The, the maximum here is 12%. So that had the largest impact. And one thing you can't see from here is, of course, this is spatially variable. I mean, the, this is only an impact in the places where there are pipes, right? And then all the ex-urban areas, there are no pipes, but this is averaged over the whole area. So it, what it's showing is that you can't see the spatial variability here, but even having the pipes occupy a relatively small amount, I don't know, maybe a quarter or so of the, of the region, um, it still has a, a big impact, okay? Um, this, is a, this is kind of lumped presentation here uh, for this graph. So then, so that was the I and I had the most effect, which was surprising to us. Um, so then the next scenario was she um, removed the, um, the next scenario here that is shown here is the, the, the no anthropogenic recharges or discharges. So she removed um, water supply leakage, um, all the ins and outs, um, she removed the water supply leakage and all the other recharge and discharge fluxes. She left the vegetation as is. And so she could see that net overall, she, um, the, 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 the net was an increase in subsurface storage. Okay, so the net overall, you got losses, you got gains, the net overall was an increase in subsurface storage when she removed those anthropogenic discharges or recharges. Okay, so then when she replaced the uh, urban land cover with vegetative cover, she called this the vegetative city scenario, there was actually a decrease in subsurface storage. Well, that might make sense because you're removing water from via the plants, right, for evapotranspiration. Um, and so we saw this small decrease in subsurface storage. What's going on over here in the fall months was a little bit complicated because uh, there's there's kind of a feedback between subsurface storage stream flow and evapotranspiration. And this, this, this is complicated. It has to do with um, the location of the maximum ET um, being um, near streams because the subsurface is shallower there. And, um, and so, uh, so um, the water table's highest there, water's most available there. And there's this feedback effect we think is set up where we have reduced stream flow in the fall leads to reduced evapotranspiration and then the overall increases in subsurface storage at the beginning of fall. So that's, it's, it, that's a little bit complicated, but that's what we, we try to parse out. So then the most surprising was the pervious city. So this is when the pervious city is when the impervious surface coverage is removed and there is an overall decrease in subsurface storage and when um, when that was thought through, or when we investigated what was going on, we found that when we, we removed the, the impervious surface area, there was actually a, um, so we see this um, subsurface storage is smaller. What happened was that the groundwater discharge to streams became greater, okay? So um, therefore the storage became less. So there was there was more there was more moving water around more more the, the, the streams became higher and the streams became higher because there was more uh, discharge from groundwater. So that was kind of a counterintuitive um, result, at least as this model shows at the scale it was run with the pixelation that was run. And so that is so then basically that's what you found. So overall, we found that the no I and I scenario had the greatest impact of all these scenarios looked at. And then if you're interested in sort of the spatial variability of all this, because it is spatially variable, this is just lumped for the whole domain, you can take a look at the paper. Okay, so the next case I'm gonna talk about uh, is a little bit different. Um, and this is a small watershed scale application in, um, 
a nearby watershed, which is the Gwynn's Falls, and um, which runs from oh the area out by um, um, Glendon down to um, Baltimore City. And so this is a Baltimore Ecosystem Study Principal Watershed, and we are focusing on two sub watersheds here: Red Run and Dead Run. So UMBC is like down here somewhere, all right. And in this particular case, we chose six small sub watersheds within these larger watersheds to look at. And what we were trying to look at is a very is a is a gradient of urbanization from the exurban area down to the more urbanized area and patterns of um, and patterns of development. So tracks and pervious area and patterns of development. So the, the principal work, the, the heavy lifting was carried out by Mike Barnes, who was a staff member of mine in 2000. 15, 16, 17 era. Um, he was a staff member, not a graduate student, and he had a bachelor's degree in hydrogeology, and he's off living in Arizona now as a consultant. But he he did this work when he was living in this region. He was part of the Curie staff as a research research scientist. So, so basically what we did was we picked out these sub watersheds along this urban to rural to urban gradient in, in and we defined the urban by fraction impervious area. So Sunnydale is only 14% impervious area. Um, the next least, the, the next most was um, this um, water should be called Runny Brook, 22% impervious. And then this um, Red Brook was 42%. So Red Brook is more commercial. That's why it has the red and the purple are development. Um, it looks lumpier, those were office parks. This uh, running me was a sort of a new cul-de-sac type development, and the Sunnydale was older, like '60s type development. But at any rate, we add up the impervious surface, the roads, the parking lots, the roofs, the sidewalks, and that's where we get impervious surface from. And then down in Dead Run, we also uh, picked out some watersheds with a gradient of impervious surface area. So we have. Um, 47, 47%, 57%, and 70% 70, 70 going from uh, DR5, which is in Dead Run at 47, to Green Gauge at 57, and then this Kevsway watershed at 70%. And again, these great big blobs are, the purple is an office building surrounded by parking lot. Now, this land cover that's used here, and this is a very finely pixelated model, is Chesapeake Conservancy land cover data set, whereas for Aditi's model, she was using very large grid cells, so she used the national land cover data set. She didn't need something that's false. So this is the Chesapeake Conservancy land cover data set. The black lines are the other watershed outlines. The boxes are the model domains. We always have to have a rectangular domain for our and looking down this in plan view as our as our box. So so the idea is just to show you our gradient of urbanization and that the patterns do look different here. Okay. What else I want to tell you about this? Oh, Mike's model, Mike Barnes model was gridded at a 10 meter pixelation here. And the subsurface pixelation varied from a 10th of a meter to 8 meters in terms of the, the variable um, DZ, the, the, the gridding in the Z direction. The model, um, these little watersheds are 0.2 to 2 square kilometers. It's kind of hard to tell. We, we, we you show the little scales here, but um, they're not all shown, they're, they're blown up to different scales, but you can see the little scale of kilometers at the bottom. So the, the, the model was run hourly for four years. There was like eight years of spin up before that. And um, these are all run on supercomputers because we can't run these on desktops. It's just too many nodes. So the number of nodes in each of these models was the number of cells about was between 60,000 and 100,000 cells. Okay, so here are some results. So, what we're showing here is mean removed subsurface storage. So again, people may have a hard time wrapping their heads around this, but I explain why we're looking at subsurface storage as opposed to aquifer levels, because we want to include the unsaturated zone. So this is for four years of data. And so here we have precipitation, which is here in millimeters. And we have um, this subsurface, the mean removed subsurface storage calculated for each of these sub watersheds shown in the colors. So there are a number of things we can note from here, and these results are presented differently than the kind of results that we I was showing for Didi, in that um, 
what we're what we're looking at here for this four years simulated, we can look at in this graph the temporal variability, event scale, seasonal, annual, and interannual variability. So just in terms of event scale, you can see how jagged this is. This is showing hourly data. It's not smooth yet over daily. So it's jagged because it's responding, the model is responding to the precipitation input. And so we have hourly precipitation, we've chopped the, the, the precipitation input to hourly and we're showing the response here in hours. So it looks very jigged, jagged. Okay, so you can certainly see that the jigs and jags, the little ones are in response to events. And you see this high frequency temporal variability. Um, and the, of course, the temporal variability is in the subsurface. So this is in response to recharge and ET or evapotranspiration, the playoff between those two in terms of that variability. All right. Um, so then you also see an annual pattern of highs and lows. So we know we should see that. So you see that the subsurface storage is generally greater in latest, greatest in late spring, and it is um, it is lowest it lowest in you know in early fall, right? And so for the four years analyzed here, you see low, 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 low whoops, low, and you see the highs. But you know you see the highs now. It's kind of interesting over here. You know, it's like what's going on? You know, where is the high for this year, right? And um, it's just, you know, the point here is that there's interannual variability. Things are not the same every year in repeating. And that's one reason we did the simulation for more than one year. This is, this, there was a real big, uh, there was a large amount of precipitation, huge in 2014 in the spring. And that led to this really high peak. Um, there was also um, a drought, a, a kind of drought situation going on in fall 2012. And then when we got Hurricane Sandy, we saw um, a recovery, a recovery from that. So there are these, you know, one off kinds of, of situations superimposed on this annual variability so that we don't see the same patterns every year. But one thing we did see was we saw this. I mean, it looks like a chromatographic effect, right? We see that we get the, the greatest and the least subsurface variability, or I'm sorry, the, the mean removed subsurface storage. Okay, we see the, the lowest lows and the highest highs are associated with Sunnydale, which is the least amount of pervious. So you see the biggest swings in subsurface storage with the least, um, the least amount of impervious surface area. And then you go all the way down here to Kev's way, which is in red, and you see, you still see swings. So water is, there is water getting into the subsurface, even though this is highly impervious. You just see that these are muted, right? In terms of time compared to the ex urban areas. And so um, that is, um, that is, so we see the temporal variability going from left to right. And we see the spatial variability by just looking at these colors of what the watershed response is. But again, it's a lumped response for the whole watershed. It's not showing you, it, nothing is shown here in terms of, well, is, is the response larger or smaller in, you know, in one part of the watershed? That's not shown here. So if you just look at this sort of lumped idea, you get a really high correlation between the percent impervious surface area and Thinking about that up and down chart is that you can think about that in terms of standard deviation. You account standard standard deviation of subsurface storage, and you get a really strong um, relationship between high uh, the standard deviation um, departure from the mean being high for the least amount of impervious area and lower for the greatest amount of of impervious area, and so um, you know so we see we see we see this. We see this negative correlation. Okay. And so, you know, there is, um, you know, there are competing effects going on here, right? So, what, you know, you can imagine is that in the more, or in the more developed area with greater impervious surfaces, you have the runoff, the, the, the water that's hitting, hitting the land is going to run off instead of seeping into the ground um, more <laughs> than it does in the ex urban areas. So, you have, you know, Reduced infiltration and increased runoff, and you have lower evapotranspiration due to reduced vegetative cover um, in the highly impervious surface areas, and you have the opposite effect in the areas with with lower impervious surface amounts. Um, 
And so, you know, that's what we, we see going on here. Now, this, this doesn't say anything about the pattern of the landscape. We could have had, you know, we, we can't tell you if we had all the impervious in one corner versus the other, whether it made a difference. There have been in the literature people who have looked at that. That wasn't the goal here. So one thing that people always ask us is how, how do your results compare to data? Okay. And so you get paper gets rejected that we just have these sandboxes we're talking about. And we don't compare to data. Okay. So one thing Mike did was he took those four years of data. He, he averaged over the four years and presents the four year average just in terms of Julian day throughout the year. So Julian day zero being January one and Julian day 365 being um, the being December 31st. So what he's showing here is he did an averaging and a smoothing and he's showing now it's smooth also because he's only showing daily subsurface storage. So you can see here that again, it's, it's clear that the, um, the, the subsurface um, storage um, um, variability, you, you can see a little bit more clearly here um, with a sort of cleaned up graph. And you can see what's interesting is that you see a clear low every year, um, but you don't there with only the four years of data, you don't see a super clear high. Now, if we had 10 years of simulated data, this would probably pop more. And you, you know, because there were so many different things going on in different years, you don't have with those four year average, you don't have a clear high going on here. So that is sort of a, a smoothed out set of simulation results showing the smooth and average in terms of temporal variability, but we're still retaining the spatial variability of the, of the different watersheds. And so there are two kinds of data we could compare to. This is data from an old, um, I think, Maryland Geological Survey report where the colleagues calculated, actually did a water balance calculated out in the gunpowder um, area, which is, of course, very rural. And we're able to, we were able to take their data and, and make a direct comparison of subsurface storage. And so what's interesting about this is that you can see that the, you know, the lows are similar order of magnitude, right? And similar timing and the high, well, we said, you know, we don't really, we can't, don't have a clear idea what's going on here because because um, we, we have only average over four years, but you can see there's a, this would be a more normal, you know, annual cycle of you know, the highs and lows with subsurface storage. So that was kind of heartening. Now, gunpowder, of course, is undeveloped, you know, or very sparsely developed. So it would, it would um, correspond more, most closely to Sunnydale um, in terms of, of the type of land cover. And then we did have one well. I monitor a series of wells throughout the region. I adopt abandoned wells. I call it the Curie's Adopt a Well Program. And if I can find an abandoned well that the owner will let me put a pressure transducer in, I do that because then we have some data to compare to. And so this is a well at the Diamond, what used to be called the Diamond Ridge Golf Course, which is off a rolling road outside of the urban growth area. Um, it's on rolling, it's it's off of, uh, it's, it's, west, no, it's, it's west of rolling road off of Dogwood, I think. But at any rate, so, what I had was four years of well data, and we averaged over that and smoothed over that. And that's what this Julian Day, um, mean, it says mean daily depth to water. Okay, so we can't calculate subsurface storage from this, but we can calculate depth to water. And so um, you don't have a comparable set of units exactly, but you do see a pattern that's similar, right? Of this one, you know, compared to to this one, and you know, out in that area by the golf course, it's, it's, it's sparsely developed. So you see that there, that four years of well data, you know, looks reminiscent of the, the simulation for sort of the exurban area. So we don't ever do what's, we don't turn a bunch of knobs to try to get matches exactly of subsurface uh, of our models to the data because there are too many degrees of freedom. I mean, you could get a model to match exactly, but if you've got a hundred thousand knobs to turn, that is not a meaningful exercise. So we do the best we can at populating the models, and then we um, we just proceed with saying how we think we're doing. Okay, now here is um, to look at temporal and spatial variability together. Here's a movie of Runnymede, and so I took the land cover and I'm pointing at you're looking you're looking at you're looking at this edge of the watershed. Okay, and this is a three dimensional simulation, and it was post hurricanes. It was Hurricane Sandy, and 
in this particular simulation, if you look at this is storage change over here with the warm, the warm colors being greater change. And the, what is shown here is that, um, <clears throat> let's see if I can get this thing to go again. Um, what you're, you, you end up showing here, let me get rid of the pen and go back because it's not working. Okay. Um, you see this, you see the system wet up and it, it's just really hard to, it's kind of hard to see the simulation, but there's a wetting up process. And then what you, what you should look at the front edge and you see the lateral movement of groundwater um, a, a after you've, you know, you've, the water gets in through vertical infiltration. And then we see lateral movement of, of the groundwater there. And so what we've actually seen happen is that water enters through the pervious areas and then it will infiltrate laterally under sidewalks and roads. And then those sidewalks and roads prevent evapotranspiration. So that's kind of a cool thing we've seen with some of this urban modeling which is um, something that people don't talk about a lot, okay? So, um, because people say, oh, you know, this impervious area, there's no water under there. Well, that's just not true. The water will migrate under these impervious surface areas. So I have a site scale application. We're gonna skip over that so you have time for questions. We've modeled a green infrastructure site. So I'm gonna skip over that and just go to, this, to the summary. So I've just tried to demonstrate that a couple groundwater surface water land surface model can be constructed for any, for any scale of interest. I've only demonstrated two scales here. We've also applied to the site scales where you have input data available. So the model output can be used for a lot of things to quantify subsurface lateral flow effects, to quantify diurnal effects of evapotranspiration on the water balance, to quantify fluxes of storage and storage of water over time in 3D space, to conduct scenario testing, I talked about some of the DD scenario testing. We've also done scenario testing green infiltrations uh, at, at, at green infrastructure sites. We've looked at like how to place green infrastructure and you know how we're changing uh, water capture. Uh, so <clears throat> you can predict the cumulative effects of impervious removal or infiltration addition on flow and storage. You can evaluate options for placement of observations to inform the model. So if you say, okay, here's the model result. Now I want to go ground truth is so where am I going to put a well? So you can actually use the models as design and then iterate, you know. Um, you know, our biggest challenge is getting hydro good hydraulic conductivity data for the subsurface. We're good at the surface with land cover and to topography with LIDAR, but the biggest challenge is getting the subsurface hydraulic conductivity data um, because it's pretty sparse. But at any rate, you can use the, the models in a design mode as well. So future directions, uh, at a regional scale, what we're working on right now with Madad Talebpour, who's a PhD student in our department, he's online right now, uh, where regional climate variability is relevant we're coupling the, the flow model with weather forecasting model to examine the coupling of energy and water systems. And so we can look at climate change considerations, interaction of the water cycle with urban heat island effects, that kind of thing. And so Madad has his methodology paper in review, and now he's marching on to model three cities with his model. So Baltimore, Denver, and Portland. At local scales, you can couple the flow models. This is a future direction with reactive transport models to examine the fate and transport of chemical species of interest. So, for example, if you wanted to look at the efficacy of GI removal on nutrients, that might be of interest to someone. Or you wanted to predict the impacts of distributed infiltration practices on watershed or watershed scale groundwater quality. And one thing we're going to look at in a new project is to look at the interaction of weathering processes and um, Groundwater quality uh, through coupled geo through coupled weathering and uh, groundwater uh, transport models. So I didn't talk about transport today. I only talked about water flow, but there are you can couple the transport model. You use the flow field as input to the transport model, and then your conservative side transport or reactive side transport. And there are components that exist to do that kind of coupling. So acknowledgements, the support uh, for the work that Mike Barnes did, that was another big NSF project, which was water sustainability and climate. It's an EPA work has been done in Philadelphia where we were looking at green infrastructure sites. We use the Stampede XSEED computer reading sources at University of Texas. We have to get grants to do that. And you can easily get a grant for computing resources if you have an NSF project. So thanks to all the folks who actually do the heavy lifting, Aditi, Mike, Theo, I didn't talk about Theo's work today. Ma Dodd and John Kemper was, uh, primo, um, keeping the field site, the field data going, and then Reed Maxwell and the Parflow user group. So there's a great, there's a group, you know, around the world that use Parflow now and they help each other out. <laughs> so, and of course, Dr. Miller, who's my partner in crime at UMBC, 
always a willing partner with all this stuff. And there we are in a stormwater tunnel for our new project with some of our instrumentation. I didn't talk about that today. Um, that's at Alexander Avenue is a six foot stormwater pipe. And um, that's just the way I'd like to end by thanking Andy for his great um, collaboration and collegiality and friendship for 17 years. Okay, thanks, Claire. Um, I think at this point, we're going to open it up for questions. So there is a chat and I think uh, the best way to do it. I see. I see you clapping. Um, if you have I didn't see. I Claire. lost my screen. Hang on. I lost my screen. Let me get fine. Okay. Let me get fine. Shall I stop sharing, I guess, or oh, there's a chat. I found um, the chat. Okay, I found the chat. Never okay. mind. So, I can right, keep right. That up. so I can I can basically what I'm gonna do is ask people to put questions in the chat just so we can go in order. And I'll call on the person to unmute themselves and ask their question live. So you don't have to track the chat. I'll I'll worry about that. Um so does anybody want to start with a cute with a with a uh, quick uh first question for us? Probably should have put out a message to invite people to do that before because it usually takes people a minute okay. or two. It's just this is a stuff a lot of stuff to wrap your head around. And um I've oh thank you. I see the clapping. Um okay, I've here tried we go. to head Thanks off the, I tried to head off the past the usual criticism we get. Um so there's okay, here we go. So I got a question here from Jason. Jason, you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Hi. Hi, Claire. Uh, first of all, great talk. Thank you. Um so I was just wondering the one of the last things you mentioned was lateral migration of flow from uh, more pervious regions to underneath sidewalks and everything like that. Uh, would that end up affecting things like uh, base flow in impervious reaches? Because I know that tends to be a little lower, at least from what I've. Uh, well, um, it's not always lower because it depends on what else is going on. Uh, Didi's written a whole paper on that. Um, it, I mean, this could have, you know, there's there's other stuff going on and I guess it partly depends on the you know, the, um, the interaction between that stream and groundwater, you know, whether it's an armored, you know, whether it's a concrete channel or, you know, um, so pervious, impervious. I mean, what we were seeing at, um, at, uh, so I guess to answer your question, if, if you, if water's still moving laterally in the subsurface and the ET is reduced because of the pervious, then there would be more water to flow. Okay. Um, and so, um, I think it just depends because, there are other because of the other things going on, but it's certainly um, you would think yes, it could affect stream based flow. But you could you could come up with scenarios where it could be both ways. All right, so where you have impervious, you don't have the roots pulling out water from vegetation, and you don't have you know you don't have soil evaporation. So that would leave more water in the subsurface to increase base flow, right? Um, so that would be one, and then it depends on how connected you are, right? Because you could have, you know, flow under impervious surface and then followed by a patch of pervious between your impervious and the stream where you could have a lot of, um, you know, removal of water by ET. So I, I think it, it just kind of depends. Okay. Thank you. That is Upal now. Is it, I'm sorry. Yes, I mean, that's Upal kind of a wishy washy answer, Upal. but it kind of depends. All right. Thanks. Upal, go ahead, unmute, and you can ask your question live. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Claire, for the great presentation. I was writing it down on that chat box. It really helps me build a good uh, and refined um, mental model. And that's so important for many of us who work in the water, even if we are not doing the modeling. So that was very helpful the way you put it. Um, my my quick question was again a, 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 a clarification on uh, in terms of making sure that I am understanding it correctly. You showed, I think, in one of the last few slides, a uh, beautiful correlation of how the the standard deviation or the fluctuations in the subsurface storage decreased beautifully with your um, um, understanding of the percent impervious, right? Right. So, so basically, what is happening is there is this big, uh, big perturbation that's happening when the rain uh, fall is happening. But that is, you know, when you have an impervious surface, that uh, fluctuation is getting communicated down to the streams and the um, stormwater pipes and the rivers, where we see the big fluctuations of the flow happening. 
where the groundwater is a bit, or groundwater or subsurface, I should say, is getting um, protected from that by the imperviousness of the surface. So that that is beautiful. So I guess you know, if you were to plot the same thing against a, a flow or stage of the receiving water body, you'd see the other the curve going other way, right? Well, we we did plot against one time. We did also plot against vegetation, right? Which is the flip side, um, you know. Because don't forget, we're we're in, yeah we're including the unsaturated zone here in subsurface storage. Um, so yeah, I mean, so yeah, um, <laughs> we plot a lot of things, and we came up with this is the best metric. So. No, this is great. You know, this is yeah. this is great. What I'm what I'm trying to understand, make sure I'm understanding it right, is that those those big uh, slugs of water are coming in with the rain. It's just not making an impact in the subsurface storage because it's getting diverted into the storm through the stormwater pipes. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where so you are seeing the big fluctuations happen. Right, right. So you know, you get you get basically the response, the perturbation response. So the the input, the perturbation is the rain, right, and the response right. is the storage. So basically right. it's infiltration becomes recharge if it hits the, you know, it stays in the subsurface. So, yeah, so we, we suspect that the, what's going on is that um, we have, but for storms, there's not a lot of ET that goes on during storms, right? Because period's too short. So that we get, right. um, that the runoff, Andy has calculated, we calculated the runoff ratios. We actually did this in response to one of the comments on the paper. We calculated the runoff ratios. And so we see much higher runoff um, in these highly impervious areas, the fraction of precipitation that goes to runoff compared to what goes into the ground, right? Um, right. So that's exactly right, you know. And then in times when it's not raining, um, there's also less being pulled. Well, that's kind of counterintuitive. So there, you know, there's the e there's not as much ET. But you know, I've some people have point blank told me, "Oh, Claire, there's no, you know, groundwater just doesn't get into urban areas. There, there's, there's no, there's no groundwater getting into these, you know, under parking lots and stuff." And there is, it just gets into the pervious parts. Okay. But you're, you're right. So we lose, we lose the water to run off flash flooding. Um, and that's, that's what the, the reason would be here for the, the lower amount of storage. There's not as much getting in. Right. It's beautiful that the model could predict that. Well, okay. So it's a model prediction. So of course, everybody wants just like, oh, well, it's just a model. And, you know, we don't calibrate these. All right. We just right. say we do the best we can. It's physically based model. We don't turn any knobs. We got really good input data except for hydraulic conductivity and we let it go and see what happens. And so it's the round here, we have excellent land cover data, the vegetation and excellent uh, topography with the LIDAR data. And those two things are big drivers. And then of course the other big driver on the meteorology, the other big driver is the um, hydraulic conductivity. So we have like three of the four covered and we just have, that's the best we can do. But you know, like where that interface is between the saprolite, the crack, you know, there's the soil, the saprolite, the highly fractured bedrock zone, and then the, the fractured, the fraction of the bedrock you get to pinch out. And the, all the action is going on in that high hydraulic conductivity fractured bedrock zone. It's like, well, where is the zone? <laughs> it's spatially variable, it's spatially variable in thickness. And we, we just don't have information on it. So we just do the best we can and then try to explain the results. But if someone really wanted to, Pick at this, they could go install a bunch of wells, which would be really expensive, you know, to see see how the sub like a gradient of wells from downtown out to Glendon um, to see what's going on. And we just we just don't have those kind of measurements, you know. So we have two short questions. Um, one is from Aaron, has to do with I and I, and the other is a request for links. So okay. and so, Aaron's already gotten that answer. Okay. <laughs> she was looking for a definition of I and I. Infiltration and flow. Yeah. Yes, um, I have, there's are two WRR papers mainly that I talked about. One with Aditi Vaskar as the lead and the other one with um, Mike Barnes as the lead. And I can, um, where do you want me to put the, the papers, Andy? I, uh, if you put the links into the chat, I think that- Oh, was no, I mean, I don't have, they're just- I have, I have copies of the papers. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we have people, people have other questions. I'll try to find the- full description of the paper. And right, I just, they're on my drive. I mean, I have them all over the place, but I don't have, right. they're not open access. So you have to get them from us. Um, so I'm just gonna invite other questions while I try to find uh, the references. Okay. I mean, I have so most of my papers I have on a Google drive if you wanna, and I, I have so the green infrastructure once well, that we did for, that was really fun because that was very engineering, but I didn't have time to talk about it. 
so I have that drive, but then it's not open to everyone either. So yeah, maybe you better post them somewhere. Anyone else? Any other questions? Mong Han. Mong Han, hi. Hi, sorry, I was too lazy to uh, type in. That's okay. So I raised my hand. <laughs> I guess we like it when people talk face to face anyway. We need the geophysics, yeah. Mon Hong. It's a big guess at what's in the subsurface. We don't know where anything is. Yeah. <laughs> He's a so, geophysicist, everybody. He's going to x ray dead run for us. <laughs> so sorry, I missed part of your talk. I guess I have a question about this slide. So I was wondering I guess there's urbanization to the watershed. Yeah, but I feel like urbanization kind of selective, right? You're trying to urbanize area where you get water resources to begin with. So I wonder if there's some kind of influence to that in this plot. Like maybe you urbanize from downstream and then you go upstream and a different location in the yeah. catchment, and then you have different yeah. catchment area. Right. So the plot is colors. lumped. Yes, the plot is a lump plot. So lump means, of course, you're averaging over space and giving just one. We're just showing time, but you know. So here I'm back showing the six watersheds, which you may have missed at the beginning of the talk. Can you see that? Yes. Andy? Okay. So these all have different patterns of development. So I think what you're talking about is, you know, in one corner you might have a different pattern than the other, and that's true. I didn't show anything. I didn't show like separate plots for. The, the, the fancy colored chromatographic plot. I didn't show those for pieces of the watershed. So it's averaged over the whole watershed um, for each of those for those plots. Each of those six watersheds was re represented by one line, but we have results for each pixel in the watershed. Okay. And so you could go to a corner that's like all pervious and say, okay, now what what does our water balance look like there compared to another corner that's completely impervious? And we didn't do I didn't show that here. You know, I just try to you got to pick results to present. And Mike spent a year. We spent a year, Mike and Andy and I, trying to figure out which results to present in the journal article because it's infinite. When you've got four years of simulation and hourly for all these pixels over time, on time and space, you've got to figure. You've got to pick something to talk about in the paper, or else you'd be writing an encyclopedia. And so, we we didn't we didn't show that Long Hong. And you know, you might expect some differences, um, especially in these places where you've got. You know, like the, the really high chunks of impervious. So, um, yeah, so you, you might expect differences, but, you know, we have the data. We just never plotted it that way. Yeah. And then in your, maybe the next 2 slides, you have this comparison with different watershed. So, um, I think it's 2 a few slides later. Uh, this 1, yes. And then the next, the next 1. Right. So you compare with this, um, the, the, the plot in the middle. And I forgot which watershed it is, but is this? this the, I just was showing the land cover on the right. This is this is running. No, no, no the I, previous slide. Previous slide. Okay, hang on. This the is like the sine wave. Doing it. Yeah. Okay. This yeah, is this, uh, this one is the gunpowder Patapsco. That was old literature from like the sixties or seventies. It was okay. natural. So I was wondering, so the entire watershed or just one little part of the watershed? Uh, it was. I believe it was for a watershed area. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm hazy on the details, um, okay. for the water balance. Yeah. And they had, okay. they had runoff because you'd have to have the runoff from a stream gauge and precipitation and some kind of estimation of storage from your well, you know, your water levels in the wells. So that was Nutter et al. I think it was 74 or 84 or something like that. Um, and I think it was an MGS Maryland geological survey publication. It's, it's in the references in the Barnes et al paper. Okay. So, um. I, I'm, I'm fuzzy. I just, I didn't look that up before I gave the talk. I apologize, but that was, um, it was, at, an, it was just an analytical water balance calculation. Got it. Okay. Which it, it wasn't a model. It was an analytical based on hydrologic data that they had on hand. Of, okay. you know, real data with doing a water balance. And, you know, a lot of times you do not have all the, the data to do water balance because, you know, often a precipitation gauge isn't where you have a stream gauge and that kind of thing. So, okay. yeah. thanks. So we are at one o'clock. Um, and, um, I don't know if anybody's got a last question they want to ask before we close, but, uh, thanks to those who did answer questions. Thanks to Claire for a great presentation. We did record the presentation. So once, uh, like our other department seminars, once we get the WebEx link back, we actually have our seminar presentations. The center for social science scholarship, uh, posts them on their YouTube. 
channel and then we put up the link on our department seminar page. So this will be accessible for people who may have missed it or want to go back and review any of the details once we get that back. So uh, I'm going to stop the recording in a moment um, and uh, then after the end of the seminar, after we close the seminar, uh, as I said, we will get um, we'll get the recording back and then we'll pause. We'll okay. and, and if anybody has any questions, you can just ask me. Um, I have a new grad student coming in in the fall um, for the new project. Um, if she can get here from Iran, so that's exciting. So, yeah. All right. <laughs>